All right, so I'm Tom McKinney. Um, I go to University of Alabama Huntsville, call as Can4 TPG. Um, I go to the same school that Chris does. So we're partners in crime at UIH where we get into trouble with all our balloon launches. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about two things. Uh, the first thing we're actually gonna talk about is something called the smart balloon, altitude control. And then we're gonna kind of wrap it up with some awesome news about a, um, an Antarctica Pico balloon mission that's gonna be happening in the uh, near future. So lots to talk about. All right, so first thing, we're gonna talk about the smart balloon first, like I said. Um, and the smart balloon is this idea is the goal is to turn any standard weather balloon. So I think we all know our classic latex balloon um, into an adaptable system that can incorporate inner instruments and most importantly, float at any level, of course, below your burst altitude. You can't fly any higher than your balloon will let you. And, of, and then change to different altitudes. So this will allow you, if you are uh, very uh, knowledgeable about where the winds are blowing to essentially drive your balloon where you wanna go. Um, so obviously uh, you're at the uh, mercy of where the winds are blowing, but if you can, uh, 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 know what you're doing, you can kind of pick where you want to go. And uh, we'll talk about this more uh, in the, the rest of the presentation. So like I said, I mean, on your left, you'll see your standard weather balloon launch we've all seen before. You go up, you burst, you come down, your parachute catches, and you land. That's, that's your classic normal balloon flight. Uh, nice and simple. Um, well, the smart balloon is what you can do is you're, you're, you're faced with a lot of different options. So you can launch, um, and in this case, this example, you can vent. So that's essentially you're removing helium from the balloon, right, to reduce your, your lift. Um, and that allows you to float. And then what you want to do, let's say you want to go back up, you can essentially do what's called a ballast drop. So that's where you reduce mass from your payload to then uh, make your payload um, want to go back up because now you have less mass and so you have more positive lift. And then, of course, you can do the same thing and you can vent and you can float at one altitude. So you have this little, I call it the little dance between your ballast and your vent. And you only have so much ballast to work with and helium. But really what it comes down to is how much mass you can drop before, you know, you can't, you know, uh, make these altitude changes. Um, and of course, you can always just vent all your helium. So let's say you want to reduce all your, your lift, you can choose to just ditch all your helium and come to the ground. So those are the two, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, examples. And we're, of course, we're going to talk about the smart balloon a little bit more. So I always like to break down uh, when I'm talking about the smart balloon, where we just talk about some equation stuff. Um, we all use Hab Hub, you know, burst calculator it, we're kind of spoiled we just go on there we put in our payload mass and you know it gives us all our values feeds it to us like a baby you know very nice um but reality hab is actually really complicated if you look in the source there's and you know these equations i'm showing are don't even scratch the surface of what hab hub does um because it essentially has to take into account drag lift um, so many different things, um, you know, the temperature of the atmosphere, how that affects helium. Um, if you actually look under the hood, you'll find that HabHub is a pretty, pretty powerful tool, pretty complicated. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about the smart balloon, I like to kind of break down these base equations first. So the first thing is our gross lift. Um, and that's made up of our three terms. The lift that the helium provides, right, to allow our payload to go up. Um, the total weight of our balloon. So if you're doing like a 200 gram balloon or a thousand gram balloon, it's really, really convenient that the names of the balloons are the mass of the balloon. I like that. And of course, the payload that, you know, you're, you're, um, you're launching. So that's, you know, everything that you want to put up. So your gross lift equals all of that, right? Um, and uh, we always like to kind of talk about, we'll talk about some next slide. Free lift is usually, you know, what causes our ascent rate. So what's really interesting is you can have negative free lift, which causes a descent rate, right? So positive free lift is you go up, negative free lift, you go down. Um, and then we have, you know, inflated volume. So you take your gross lift and you divide that by the lifting force, what gas you're using. So in this case, it's helium, or, you know, if you're using hydrogen, I think it's around 30.1 or something grams uh, per cubic feet. All right, so then this is kind of the big money. We have an ascent rate equation. So that's your drag 
um, and then your free and gross lift. You can see the equation right up there. And what we actually do is we can solve for free lift, right? And I call this the big money equation because it allows us to build this kind of free lift budget which is uh, really neat. So when we're talking about a balloon that has um, some mass where we wanna change, uh, you know, drop mass or drop helium to change our altitude to either go up or down, we refer to everything in free lift because it's really convenient to do so. Um, and I'll show you that in a sec. So you can see right here, we solve for free lift. We have a cent rate or grow lift and a K. And K is a little complicated. We kind of have to make some assumptions because remember, our, the size of our balloon is also changing, which changes the drag, which changes you know, a lot of different things. So the K value is kind of like shooting in the wind a little bit, but really it does work out pretty well. We usually use 142 for our K value for the balloons that we're using. When you start to get really big, it's really where it kind of starts to matter. Um, all right, so this example right here, uh, this is a set rate versus free lift. So this is uh, the first test flight we ever did, which the K, we call it uh, by call sign K4UH-11. K4UH is the call sign of the Space Harbor Club, pretty cool, at UAH. Um, so we had, these are our calculated values, a gross lift of 3,615, an inflated volume of 128 cubic feet. And then uh, the set rate before we're you know, doing any venting is around 3.5 meters per second. So what I like to do is when we modify our free lift budget, we wanna hold our gross lift constant. And you'll see why that uh, we do that in a second. So we can then, if we do that, if we make that assumption, we can find the lift lost or gained to determine a vertical ascent rate. So what's really cool when you make that assumption is essentially, if you look at this plot, um, you can see that for this case, for our payload mass and the amount of helium that we're putting in it, we only need to lose or gain 42 grams of free lift to go up or down one meter per second. So that's not a lot of mass to, to achieve a, an ascent rate or a descent rate. So what that essentially means is if we, let's say we're floating and we wanna go back up, all we have to do is ditch 42 grams of mass. And the, the case of you'll see in the next uh, slide is we have a ballast tank of some liquid. And if you have a tank that only has you know, 400 grams, that's not a lot, but think about it, 42 grams, um, you know, you can make a ballast change around eight times. So, and that's of course, only if you're doing one meter per second, you can see as we go up, you need to ditch more mass to go up quicker. That's the nature of this equation. Um, so you don't want, if you want to say, well, I want to get, let's say I'm floating at one kilometer and I want to get up to five kilometers as quick as possible. Well, you got to be careful, right? Because you have to think about, well, if I ditch this much mass, uh, let's say I ditched like 250 grams, well, you just lost almost all your ballast, but at least you're going up to 2.5. Whereas if you only want to ditch 42 grams, you can go about one meter per second, but you're going to get to your next target destination slower. So when you're talking about wind models and doing modeling and stuff, uh, it's really advantageous to get to the next level quicker to model it pretty well instead of going really slow between your models and you have to know the wind, where the winds are blowing at all times. So um, there's a lot of decisions to make when you're planning a flight. But that is a really cool factor. Um, and that's a powerful thing to know for your payload. You only need to lose a certain amount of mass to achieve a certain result. And it also allows you to know, well, how many changes can I make before you know, it runs out? So, all right. So just to kind of prove to you, you're probably like, Todd, there's no way. So this is a test flight. Um, this is actually the first payload I built. Um, I don't know if y'all can hear this, but essentially I filled this balloon up to neutral buoyancy. I have a switch on the, the, the top, it has a tank of water inside. And you can see just by turning this little ballast tank on, you'll see it takes a little bit to pump out. Just that little bit of water is causing, you know, that balloon to go back up. You can see that's not a lot, right? Um, so you can see it's accelerating pretty, pretty quickly too. And I also had to pull up that rope too. So you can tell it is really powerful to be able to do that and know that you don't need to drop a lot to achieve a result. So when you're flying in the atmosphere, 
um, and you want to make changes, well, you don't need to lose a lot of mass to do that. So very cool. All right. All right. So this is the first ever payload. This was actually from a program uh, that we do in the Space Arbor Club called Two Month, where a bunch of students are given a challenge that they need to design something for. And actually, I gave them this challenge of building smart balloons. So this was actually one of the first smart balloons was through this program. Um, they did a really great job. Um, I've kind of come up with all these equations and, you know, theory behind this, and they kind of designed the payload off of that. So it literally, like I said, you have a ballast tank, batteries, and then you have a flight computer, usually with like a TNC and a, you know, open log SD, uh, SD card logger. And then you have uh, uh, voltage uh, motors that control the, either the, the uh, solenoid that keeps the helium in and the ballast pump that pumps the liquid out. So it's relatively simple if you think about it. Um, it's not a very complicated device, but you just kind of have to know what you're doing in order to, you know, choose where you want to flow, when you want to vent. And usually what we do is, I think, I'm, I'm debating if theirs had a GPS on it. I think they just went off of pressure. So pressure, you just say, okay, when I reach a certain pressure level, do this action. So it's, it's really not that difficult um, a, a, of a design. Um, so you can see right here, it attaches directly to the balloon neck, it's suspended, and then uh, we actually uh, have little grooves here where you can zip tie the neck to it. Um, we used a, a light APRS to uh, send data back, uh, just one minute updates, um, 18650 batteries, um, and yeah, pretty cool. So for the first flight, um, this was the uh, kind of first flight. They decided to float at four kilometers above ground level. Um, and the goal of this flight was really to validate this kind of free lift budget theory. So um, this flight ended up floating for six, uh, six hours at four kilometers. Um, and this was a really, really great flight to observe these kind of float characteristics. Because when you're designing a system um, that has no radio control, you know, it's all on board, your system has to know the difference between, oh, am I, you know, adiabatically warming and cooling going up and down, or did I leak helium and I'm coming down, I need to correct myself with the ballast or something like that. So your system has to know that. So this is this flight was really good to demonstrate how a floating latex balloon after you vent it, how it performs. So we're gonna look at this. So as you can see at the first time we vented to a one meter per second ascent rate at two kilometers. Um, so that's our 42, three grams, uh, free, uh, excuse me, 42 grams of free lift. And then we, at two, we vent to zero meters per second to a zero, uh, zero meter per second ascent rate where we have zero grams of free lift. Remember, we're all talking about terms of free lift. Um, and then down here, three, we vented to uh, a descent rate of one meter per second and landed. So pretty cool. All right, so let's kind of look at some stuff over here. So this is the ascent rate versus time. Um, so what's really neat about this is you can see there is an oscillation of, you know, of ascent rate. So we can have both a negative and positive ascent rate. So that's what I was talking about when I meant like, okay, we have to be careful. Our system knows the difference between I am floating and I'm just naturally oscillating with the atmosphere or, oh, I need to go down or up to correct for some issue or I'm not at my float altitude yet. So we actually, what was on the computer is it was programmed to have certain bounds. It would say, well, if I'm above a 0 0.75 meters per second ascent rate, or I'm going down at negative 0 0.75 meters per second, um, then correct itself, right? So if I'm going down and I need to be floating, drop ballast and come back up. Or if I'm going too high, vent to come back down. So there are bounds between your float altitude. And we found that the oscillation when you have a floating balloon uh, is between 0 0.3 meters per second to negative 0 0.3 meters per second. So that's a really good, like, you know, bounds that you know, okay, that's what the range will float in. Um, and this, we kind of are theorizing that there's something called uh, adiabatic warming and, and cooling. So essentially when the balloon goes up, it rises, it cools, comes back down, compresses, warms, and comes back up. So that's why that balloon does that, because it's an adiabatic process. Um, all right, so let's look at, this is vertical acceleration. This is kind of just another view of it. Um, and like I said, this is all important to saying, you know, if we have a system that's, you know, doing its own calculations, it knows what it's doing at all times. And we have those bounds to work around. So that's a pretty cool uh, thing to have. 
Um, I also include this on here because this is always a problem with floating balloon payloads when they're launching in the daytime is the solar solar heating effects. So this, I think you all have probably experienced this on Pico balloon flights a lot where you launch your balloon and you know it's getting colder, it's getting colder, you chief float and now you're warming. You're like, wait a minute, is that real? Of course not, it's solar heating. So you can see right after we achieved a float, the temperature started going up and I, I am, fairly certain it is not 23 degrees Celsius at four kilometers in the atmosphere. So um, kind of interesting. So that's always something to keep in mind when we're doing science with a floating balloon payload, because it will probably, the temperature, you have to correct for it because it's proportional to the sun's sun angle. Or you can add a fan. We actually have that on our new balloons. We have an aspirating system. So it blows air on the temperature sensor. So we can get the correct temperature measurement. All right, so I wanted to include this because this is what we used a lot to predict uh, where we wanna drive our balloon. And we've done really short flights because we haven't really done long flights yet because we wanna recover the payload right now. Um, but when we're doing longer flights, uh, uh, NOAA ARL, uh, Air Resource Laboratory, high the high split team has an amazing tool. It's actually called the balloon forecasting tool. Um, I know a lot of people have used just the normal, uh, you know, high split trajectory model where you just one run one trajectory. But what this tool does is it says, okay, let me run a trajectory. And then after some time, let me pick three altitudes, run another trajectory, and then do that every three hours. So now you just have this massive gunk of trajectories that have been run at many different points all over where your start trajectory was. So what that allows you to do is then you can pick you all online on this tool, a spot you wanna go to in this range and it will output the altitudes you have to go to to get there. So really useful if you have a balloon that you know, wants to ride different wind patterns to get to some destination. So this is all online and they do, it's, it's called the balloon forecasting tool and it's pretty great, really cool. So like I said, we haven't attempted really, really long flights yet because we like to get our payload back, um, but we're gonna start doing that soon in the near future. But you can see it has altitude shifts. Um, and I will say the one thing it's not very good about is it, it, it kind of assumes an instantaneous jump so that's why I was talking about where if you have a really slow ascent rate going up, right, it's not, you have wind affecting it as it goes up. It's not an instantaneous jump to your next altitude. So it's really nice. I like to pick altitudes that are like one kilometer apart. So you can just get to the next one, get to the next one, and just use altitudes that are pretty close to ride where you want to go. So really neat. All right, so this is, I like to put this, it, it's absolutely a disaster chart. It looks awful, but it kind of shows everything we talked about, modifying our free lift, positive free lift versus negative free lift, how that plays into the ballast and the gas venting. Um, and of course the high split trajectory that determines when you want to do your ballast changes, right? Because it's all about where the winds and where you want to go. Um, so this is kind of the new smart balloon. We've actually just finished these payloads. Uh, we've been working a lot with uh, NOAA ARL to do some forest fire research. So these actually have particulate matter sensors on them. Um, you can actually see there's a cool article that was done. Uh, we're doing some interesting uh, research. If there's any big forest fire plumes that come down here, we're gonna launch these balloons and float them in the plumes. Just kind of check out what the particulate matter values are. Um, so it's a kind of cool story. We've been, you know, we're, we're very heavily involved with NOAA ARL. Uh, uh, we have a lot of good contacts over there. But essentially, this is the new playload. It's actually equipped. We're going to, it's going to have 12, 18, 650 batteries on it. A lot of power. We've uh, figured out it can fly for around three days um, without any, any, uh, any charging. Uh, we're definitely in the way near future thinking about doing radio communications and uh, solar panels on this thing. So we don't have to rely on so many batteries. Um, but right now we're just really interested in getting the data for our NOAA colleagues. So these are really cool payloads and we're hoping to ramp up some launches soon if we can get the helium. It's all about the helium, right? All right, so this was one of another test flights we did in 520-2022. Um, this was a very short flight we did. 
Um, you can see we did uh, altitude. We floated at two kilometers, uh, came down, floated at one kilometer, and then vented to fall. So this was another good test of our system that we did very, very early. Um, it's really neat. And like I said, we we didn't want to do a lot of these tests and before because the winds were so strong um, when we actually developed these payloads. We didn't want to drive to go get them. We wanted to recover them and save them for the campaign, the forest fire stuff. But we did validate that, you know, what I talked about, the free lift budget and all that stuff. It is a very useful thing and it, it, it is a, it, it works, you know, it's so, but I will say this next slide, you'll see when uh, it might not work <laughs> and there are issues with that theory of just assuming a, you know, a constant free lift and just assuming no temperature effects and stuff like that. So I call this flight the neighborhood skimmer and Chris is nodding his head right now because we all knew too well. So we did a flight at uh, nighttime. Uh, I think we launched around 10 or 11 p.m. And if you, you know a few things about meteorology, what happens at nighttime is you get what's something called an inversion. So during the daytime, uh, the atmosphere actually cools with height. So you go up, you know, it gets colder. But at nighttime, closer to the surface, it actually warms with height. And the reason why that is because all that energy that was absorbed during the day, um, all the sun hitting the concrete, the buildings, everything, radiates that heat, all that energy that was stored was radiated out at night. So it actually warms with height the first few hundred meters. So what we did was said, okay, let's fly a balloon. So we launched it, it went up and what it ended up doing, I'll come back to these plots to show you, is it depleted its ballast. So this plot right here is actually colored, we call it a drop state. This is color coded for when the ballast was on. So you can see it, it took off itself and said, okay, I need to start going up. So it ditches ballast. It starts to come up. And originally it's like, okay, I'm going up at the right speed, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, okay, well now I'm too slow. So I need to ditch ballast again. So it starts coming back up. And all this time, remember the temperature is warming, right? So you can see over time, it's dropping ballast stops, dropping ballast stops, dropping ballast stops. This is a very nice cycle where it's just constantly ditching mass to try to keep it at this constant ascent rate until it finally runs out of ballast and comes back down. And you can see it actually kind of stabilizes here, comes back down. And I'll talk about this section over here in a second. But what's really important to note about that and what we learned through this test flight is originally we were going to say, OK, let's limit how fast it can go up. Because we've had problems in the past where if you put too much gas in the balloon, it actually will not vent. And it's because it's going up too fast, has too much lift. Whereas, you know, if you have a slower ascent rate, you can vent out the gas quicker to, you know, get that nice float curve, I call it. Um, so what we, what we found is, okay, let's just like ballast from ground and go up at a nice one meter per second ascent rate and then vent if it's going too fast. And this is what we did. So what was happening as it was going up, it was ballasting, it was venting, it was ballasting, it was venting. Until finally, like I said, once you ran out of your ballast, you're done. You run out of ballast and then it went to the ground. So, but we thought it was going to land. We're like, okay, it's going to land. Let's go get it. Um, it's close by. We launched right here it restabilized. <laughs> so this is floating. And I want to, I want to mention that the, the, the ground is at around 212 meters, right? This is a uh, altitude of, above mean sea level. So this balloon is floating 60 meters above the ground, just coasting. Um, and I actually show you there's very little, this is probably the crappiest quality I've ever seen in your life. Um, but this balloon is just, chilling above the ground, 60 meters, just, just going along. Because what's happening, it's trapped in that inversion. All that heat is pushing it up. So it's just floating at one level, very, very close to the ground with that backup parachute line suspended below it. This is probably, you can't see me there. I'm here trying to jump up and grab it. <laughs> um, but it's right, it's right there. So that is a really interesting feature and in where you got to be careful about flying these floating balloon payloads because what happens is that the thermal heating effects, especially during the nighttime, it's very strong close to the surface. And you, you, when you're talking about buoyancy, buoyancy is directly related to heat and it will, it will do with some wacky things. So you can see it comes down right here. We're driving between roads, trying to catch this thing. And this thing 
would get to some concrete, it would just keep going back up because concrete radiates heat. And you can actually see right here, Google Earth didn't plot it right, that this did not land in a lake. When it got to the water, a surface that is colder because it absorbs energy and it's not radiating energy, the balloon actually starts to descend. And you can see as it goes back to the concrete, it goes back up. So the float altitude was directly related to the temperature gradient below it. Very cool stuff. You can actually see this right here. This is the water and then the concrete. So very cool, very cool stuff. I, I really like this flight because it kind of shows that the thermal um, properties of the surface and how you know buoyancy relates to it. So that is the smart balloon. Um, I'll take questions after about it, but we're going to talk about the next thing, which is a really exciting announcement um, is I recently put in a uh, proposal to fly Pico balloons down at near Meyer Station 3. Um, if y'all don't know, that is the German station. And if that sounds familiar, that is the station that has the whisper um, receiving and transmitting station. Uh, so that was accepted. So in the uh, next Antarctic summer, uh, I will be traveling down with a few Pico balloons to deploy some from the Antarctic station. So really, really exciting stuff. So this is actually uh, the slide that I presented to the PIs, uh, the principal investigators at um, a group meeting for all the people who will be down there. And basically what I did with this grant was I, I uh, broke up the scientific objectives into two things. The first one is, you know, how do these tiny micro super pressure balloons behave, right? That's always important. Um, and then uh, kind of tying in with the, uh, the 20 meter uh, whisper transmitter, how that offers propagation throughout the entire Antarctic summer. And like I said, there is a whisper transmitter at um, Niermeyer. So it'd be very interesting to compare to their, um, their capabilities. Um, and of course, I'm a big bottling guy, which you'll see in a second. Uh, will the NOAA high split model uh, reflect the actual bloom paths down there? Um, so I will say, if anyone has any, uh, we're going to be flying primarily Bill's Sky Trackers down there. But if anyone has any, you know, uh, whisper tracker that they want to be able to say that it was deployed from uh, the Antarctic continent, my email is right up here. Um, so. I would really love to get as many launches down there. As y'all know, it's not a lot of helium to deploy these balloons. And that's what I included in my proposal. Because usually when you go down there, they, they deploy these massive super pressure balloons um, that take you know, many, many tanks of helium. But you know, Pika balloons, it's nothing. So um, we can probably do uh, nine or 10 down there. Right now I proposed five, but um, it, for the amount of helium that we are promised at the station, we could probably do 20. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So if you're interested, my email's at the top. Like I said, we're going to be flying Bill's sky trackers down there. But if anyone wants to have something flown, uh, definitely send me an email. And uh, the, I will say it has to be relatively simple, plug and play. You know, we're down in Antarctica. There's not a lot of, you know, it's not like I can burst out my solder gun and solder in the middle of the, the research station. So um, just keep that in mind if you're interested in that. My email's right there. Um, so just kind of talking about the high split modeling side, I'm at, my concentration is atmospheric science. So I do a lot of modeling. Um, these are, you, everyone's probably used high split in here to protect peekaboo pass, but this is a new approach. This is actually uh, something I've created called uh, trajectory curtains. Essentially what you do is you run a trajectory backward and forward through time and then you do that at 30 meter intervals all the way up. So this plot is really useful for determining what air parcels are going to experience sunlight. For instance down here you can see that these backward trajectories just came just right there you can see it um, came from an area where there was a little sun peeking over the horizon. Again, this sun flux plot is obviously dark because these trajectories were run when there was Antarctic uh, winter time, so it's very dark. Um, and then you can actually look visually see at a at an angle at a you know al altitude versus time angle the jet I call it the jet core. You can see you know what uh, gradients there are with the velocities, and you can also see how the trajectories are changing direction over time. And then I have the wind barbs plotted for the uh, forecast time zero. So uh, th this model is really useful for determining if you want to do a safe Pico launch, because if you have a lot of wind shear, 
like this or at the surface, uh, wind shear is not fun for Pico balloons. They really like to have a nice constant uh, ascent rate, especially when they're going to their float altitude range. They really like that. This is another example. These are wacky. It's like a bad hair day. Um, you can see uh, this was run over actually NOAA ARL. Uh, you can see the sunflux plot now. We have sun. Uh, you can actually see the moisture gradients, like a breathing animal, I like to think about it. You can see the moisture uh, being invected away or toward your forecast location. Um, and then you can do a lot of cool stuff with your wind direction and, you know, temperature and stuff like that. So really cool stuff. All right, so that was the talk. I know it was 30 minutes pretty quick, um, but I definitely want to leave enough uh, time for discussion and thoughts. Uh, and I just want to thank you all for, uh, for giving me the time to talk about it because uh, I love talking about balloons. I think we all do. We're all balloonyacs. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, Todd. Um, uh, I'm mm -hmm. well. I do have a quick question. Um, yeah, what's up? So about yeah, so about um, kind of like uh, piloting the balloons. It's I mean, I couldn't be happier that you talked about that because that's uh, a part of um, a team at the University of Calgary who's uh, actually doing exactly that. Um, yeah. And so I noticed you said you were uh, perhaps I missed it. You said you were uh, venting out gas. Did you cover yes. how that was done or? Yeah. So this is a good point. So all we are essentially doing is we have a big. Let's see a photo of it. Uh, I don't think it's on this one. It's it's behind here, but it's basically just a solenoid vent. So it's interesting to say that because we tried air pumps and um, you know all that stuff. But what we actually do is because we're using such a small balloon, um, we just use the latex force of the balloon to actually blow out the gas. Now this can only work up to a certain altitude because there's a point at which the balloon gets so big the force per unit area is so spread out the gas just doesn't want to go out of the the bottom. Um, that happens at around 27 kilometers depending on the balloon size of course. Um, but for the measurements and all that stuff we're doing it's in the troposphere mostly zero to 10 kilometers. So we can essentially vent and rely on the latex force to push the gas out anywhere in the altitude range that we're going to be using. So we just and we actually use a pretty hefty heavy solenoid vent and uh, um, I really like using something a little hefty, something that has a lot of weight, just because you want a good anchor point where the balloon neck is attaching. Because if you have something too, if your payload is too lightweight and you don't have that good anchor point, and remember your box is attached to the balloon. So it's gonna go crazy. So we use a pretty heavy solenoid vent for, for what we use to kind of be that anchor. And we've seen it works pretty well. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. That's uh, that's really cool because we actually did try um, a solenoid vent, but we ran into the. Uh, oh, and of course, someone's calling me now. Be hmm. quiet. Um, yeah, we we ran into the uh, exact same problem. Uh, yeah. Just the pressure, just uh, the pressure differential wasn't enough. So what we're doing now is we're working on. Uh, we actually want to make it totally passive so yeah. the event itself has no electronics on board it's actually just a mechanical solution and um yeah we're trying to um like glue 